Welcome to the Dear Professor series, where college students who take courses online speak their minds. I am your host and e-learning strategist, Dr. Kelly Austin, who is honored to have a conversation with today's guest as she sheds light on her experiences as an online student. I have been teaching online since 2004 and made the tough decision to obtain my PhD through an online program. So I have been both an online instructor and an online student. As a result, I know that there are some wonderful things happening with online programs, as well as some not so wonderful things going on. The purpose of this series is to help professors and students experience a more fulfilling online learning environment by allowing students to reveal their needs and pet peeves. My hope is that this information will support professors in making the necessary changes or adjustments in the design and delivery of their online courses, which should ultimately enhance student success and satisfaction with distance education. So if you're interested in hearing what students have to say about their lived experiences online, please hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so that every Wednesday at 8 p.m., the latest episode will come straight to you. Also, feel free to comment about anything said and ask questions. If you are listening via a podcast platform, please be sure to follow and rate the series so that your interest and opinion of the show are made known. Today, I am honored to be sharing this time and space with Mrs. Keisha Grant. Keisha, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I am harmonious and happy. How about that? I like that. I like that. That's one of my affirmations. Yeah, that's one of my affirmations every day. (laughs) So, Keisha, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I am 34, um, 35 loading in 10 days. Um, I'm married to my best friend, Mr. Grant, and we have three beautiful children, ages 19, 10, and 9. I am also a member of the greatest sorority known to man, the illustrious Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. I have an associate's and a BS in early childhood education, and I am actively seeking an online master's programs with the heart, with the hopes, excuse me, of starting that next fall. I am currently a school readiness coach for Head Start under the Families and Communities Rising platform. And I have been in the field of early education for over 10 years, with eight of those years as a pre-K teacher. So that's just a little bit about me. So, Keisha, did you say your birthday's in 10 days? Yes, ma'am. December 5th. Oh, well, happy birthday. Do you have plans? Um, Actually, my brother's birthday was yesterday, so we always get together and do something. Um, So this year, we're just kind of... um doing like a little kickback, nothing super huge. We're not young anymore. So we're just going to continue our little tradition that we've had since we were kids. So I beg to differ. You're 34. You're very young. (laughs) I wish my body understood that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, So you're going to jump into the master's degree next fall. You said, yes, I've actually looked um, at a couple. I've been weighing my options with a couple different schools. Um, but I did find out recently that my employer does, um, they'll honor the teach scholarship, which therefore I could get my master's for free. So I'm going to go with one of those schools. That's what it's about getting that degree for free. So let's talk about Head Start. How long have you been working for Head Start? For Head Start, I'm going into my fifth year with them. And this new role, you're out of the classroom. Do you enjoy that? Tell us about it. It has its perks. So um, like I said, I've always known as a child that I wanted to work with kids. I mean, I was helping my mom in the church, teaching Sunday school and vacation Bible study and all these things. Um, So being in the classroom was always like the big picture. It wasn't until maybe about, mm, I'll give it about 
two and a half, maybe three years ago, where it was just kind of like, I can be doing so much more. I just had this this thing that kept going through my brain that was like every year I get about 15, 16 students and that's 16 kids that, you know, I've helped shape them to get them ready for school. Um, but then I also started noticing we were losing a lot of, you know, good teachers. And from my observation, it was always because there wasn't enough support or there wasn't um, enough training. We were just kind of, you know, throwing teachers in. So I just had this thing that if I could help, you know, shape three teachers, now we're not just touching or, you know, helping 16 kids, that's 16 times three. So, you know, with a bigger picture, it's been great. I do have my moments of, you know, oh, I have this really great idea for an activity. I want to do this. (laughs) And then it's like, oh, wait, (laughs) you're not in the classroom. So, you know, I'll kind of like go inside myself a little bit and figure out who can I share this idea with that will bring it to fruition. Um, but when I do go into the classrooms to work with the teachers, I do still get that, you know, little bit of a moment of being with the kids. So it kind of feels that little, that little hole a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just glad they have that position at Head Start because teachers do need support. I think we throw them into the classroom rather quickly and mm-hmm. expect them to know how to do so many different <laughs> things. The skills that they have to have, that skill set is so Uh, grand and we expect them to master it so quickly and it's just not that easy so I'm glad they have you and do they seem to appreciate you they do they do um it's actually we have two actually there's three coaches and then we have a bilingual literacy coach so our team is about four um for the coaching team so um I particularly work with the preschool teachers our other coach does um infant toddler and threes and then one of our other coaches he kind of does our partner site so he's working with all ages and then we have our bilingual literacy coach and she works with all the the, every age group so yeah so it's a good time it (laughs) is it sounds like it so Keisha what's your general experience with taking online courses So I actually took my first online course in 2013 and it was not like planned. It was more so I needed this class and they were only offering it online. Um, So I took the class and fell in love with online classes and had been there ever since. And mostly it was because they didn't require me to have to get up super early because I'm not really a morning person to be going in and trying to read some articles or anything like that. Um, and then it also allowed me to be able to work around, you know, my work schedule. So I was learning while I was working as well. Um, and for the most part, I've had a really pleasant experience with the online courses and henceforth why I'm looking to do my master's program online as well. Cause I mean, being a mom and working and having a husband is like having another kid sometimes. So it's like really hard to try to go into like a physical po- uh, physical classroom. So that's my main focus is being able to do that. Okay, so we'll pretend we didn't hear you say having a husband is like having another kid. Okay, okay that's okay. I won't tell him I said it, even though I tell him every day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So Keisha, if you were to rate your experience with online courses on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being outstanding and one being horrific, what rating would you give and why? With an overall rating, I would give it a 7.5. And that's only because for the most part, my experience has been great. I've been able to go through, do everything smoothly. And then there are times where it is the most stressful (laughs) decision um, you can make. Because sometimes when you are an online student, sometimes it can feel like you don't really exist because they don't see you. So you're not in their face all the time and it's always virtually through email or you know trying to catch them on office hours when you're not even on your break at work so it's 
that's why I would give it that 7.5. Okay. So I asked this of another guest. I want to ask you, when you say seven a 7.5, when you think of a 7, would you say that's a C? Or would oh. you, well, how would you equate that? So I'm learning that with my, my, my own children, that the grade process has changed. Okay. So technically, based off of their grading scale, it would be a low B. Okay. Because it's 7.5. Yeah. Yes, seven point five. So it would be like right. It's like right there. Like it just made it over the ledge to be a B. Oh, okay. I'm glad. Just I made it over the edge. Yes. Okay. Well, let's dig a little deeper into your experience with online courses. Now, Keisha, sometimes when students are taking courses, they are exposed to information, but they're not given the opportunity to use that information to practice and develop relevant skills. Can you think of a course in which you learn one or more skills that you were able to either use it in another course or use it more importantly in the real world? So I cannot remember the actual name of the course and I don't even necessarily know if this skill was um, what they were intending for us to do. I mean, it probably was because this really was, this professor was very intentional about the way things were presented in class. Um, so in one of the classes I was taking a couple years back, there was a portion that with everything we read, everything we did, we had to literally put a blurb in on how it connects to the real world. Um, and at that time, it was kind of like, oh, they just got us doing a little bit extra. Like when I first saw it, I was like, this is just something more for me to have to write. I got to go cook dinner, you know, all these different things. But the more that I kept doing it, the more it began to make sense, because then I noticed that I was actually retaining the information because it was now something that was relevant to me. And so to tie that into my actual profession at that time, um, with our lesson plans in a pre-K classroom, there's a section in there about like global awareness and research. And that's a really big, you know, idea for four-year-olds. However, because of that ability that I learned in that class where I could tie in something that didn't seem like it was relevant to me, but I could find a way to connect it to what was really happening with me um, and how it, you know, actually did relate to me, I was able to do that in my classroom. So we took some really big ideas. For instance, just an example, I taught my four-year-olds about um, the different types of clouds. Like we did a whole study on clouds and we taught, I made it relevant to them by every day we would go out and they were able to pick out different clouds and then we were turning it into, okay, now we have to figure out what type of cloud this is. So they're, oh, that's a cumulonimbus. And this is a, um, a stratus cloud. And it was really exciting to hear the parents come back in and be like, my child just told me the weather for the morning based off of what they looked at with the clouds. Oh, and my so it was, you know, a big, a really big topic that most people wouldn't, you know, that's something they learn in third, fourth, fifth grade, somewhere around that time frame. But yet these four-year-olds were able to grasp the concept of the different clouds and the water cycle because we made it relevant to them. And I feel like that class helped me to be able to do that. Oh, Keisha, that was such a good example. Because, you know, I can I can think of classes where you have rote memorization and you might have made an A in the class. But then you're like, mm -hmm. but what did I learn? What did I learn? Exactly. You know, it disturbs me. My, my daughter's in the 12th grade and she makes you know really good grades. But she'll say to me all the time, but mommy, I didn't learn anything. Isn't that sad? It is <laughs> very really, sad. It's very, very sad. And so a skill means that you are able to do something. And that's what matters in life, whether we're an employer, employee, entrepreneur, you have to be able to do something with what you've learned. And when you can't do something, you can't use it. What is its purpose? 
So exactly. I just really, yeah, I really appreciate you going in such depth about that. That's exciting. Now, have you ever taken an online course that totally pushed you out of your comfort zone? I did. Um, I took a class and it pushed me out of my comfort zone in a positive way. Um, it was one of those kind of like, you know, when you're going to get your degree. You have like certain classes that are um, directed towards your major. And then you have those just kind of classes that they make you take. Um, so this one was based off of communication. It was a communications course and it was talking about um everyone's different styles of communicating and conflict resolution and conflict management and taking the course. The reason it pushed me out of my comfort zone was because it made me relook at and rethink my life completely where Mm -hmm. here I was thinking I was this complete, like total, you know, strong person when in reality, I was someone who was, I didn't like conflict at all. So I would just kind of seep into myself um, and just let things happen just because I didn't want to have to argue with you. And, and I realized like, wait, that's not going to help me in the future. Like I can't just allow for things to be, you know, falling apart and I'm just going along with it just because I don't want to have to argue with you about it afterwards. Um, So it actually helped me see, I don't want to say the wrong in what it was, but it helped me see where I could improve on myself internally, not just to get an A in the class, but it was genuinely something that pushed me to become a better person, which now um, with my new position, now I'm not really working with little people. I'm working with big people. And <laughs> it's definitely something um, that was needed to be able to learn how to work with other people by understanding not not just my own communication style, but being able to see other people's communication styles as well. So that then that way, when I do have an idea or if there is a problem, I know how to communicate with these people. Oh, Keisha, you made me think about something. Um, Uh When I was teaching God and behavior and young children, conflict management is a major portion of that class. And I remember students saying, man, we're sitting up here trying to teach the children how to resolve conflict. When we as adults are not really skilled at doing that. And, oh, no. and so that, you know, that course would really make them, I would give them these scenarios to practice adult scenarios to help them to see how difficult it is. Because sometimes we want children to behave as little adults and adults themselves can't manage conflict. So that really made me think about that, how every time I taught that course, it would make me have to grow in that area. And then my students would say, wow, having to walk through the steps of how to help children resolve conflict is making me see where I don't do that very well in my own personal life. So I'm right. like, you just giving us the goods tonight. Just, just, I mean, I'm pretty sure you've um, looked into it, but for any other educator or just parent, anybody that may listen to this um, based off of that, there is a really good, um, Mm, I don't want it's a workshop, but there's also a book um, about conscious discipline. And um, it really goes into being able to be self aware as yourself. Like, you know, when we're in education, there we're always trying to do professional development on how can we help children learn conflict resolution and, you know, things like that self regulation. Um, Mm -hmm. But this particular program focuses on the adult and how you learn how to be conscious and able to self-regulate so that then you can in turn teach that to the students that you have in your care. Yes, indeed. I'm familiar with Conscious Discipline. It is a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. So shout out (laughs) to that (laughs) workshop. So Keisha, let's talk about your needs now as an online student. A need is defined as something you require because it is essential or very important. When you click on that online course or those courses that you're taking, what do you require or desire to be successful? So when taking an online course, I need a few things. I need explicit instruction, open communication, and feedback. 
So for me personally, I have a vivid imagination and anxiety, and that's two things that do not go well together. Therefore, I need to know exactly what the expectations are. If not, I will definitely go down a rabbit hole that I probably didn't need to go down. (laughs) Um, I also need to be able to have open communication between myself and the professor. Like if a question arises, I should be able to contact that instructor and get an answer in a timely manner. And the feedback, that's the what ties all of that together is, you know, if I have a question or, you know, something doesn't make sense to me, I should be able to hear back from the instructor, the instructor or professor like quickly. Um, Like for instance, if an assignment is due by September 1st, 1159 and it's turned in on time, I should know how I did well before the end of the semester when it's time to take that final exam. Because Mm. if you're not turning that grade back into me until the day before the exam, I that just I just lost a lot of time to be able to go back and get versed in what this exam is about to be on. Because I could have been on a like I said, I could have gone down one of my rabbit holes and I'm thinking I'm on the right track and here I am all the way in Egypt and we supposed to be in North Carolina. And now I just failed my test. Now Keisha, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I hear this often. So what do you think is keeping instructors from giving that feedback online in a timely manner? So so the logical part of my brain understands that most of the time our online instructors, they are probably teaching three, four hundred other kids or not kids, but students. Right. Um, And so I know that I'm not the only one here that needs to get my grade back. You have a lot of other things that you also have to grade. Totally understand that. However, when I signed on for up for that class, I want to be able to be, you know, successful in it as well. And I need that feedback to be able to do so. So like I said, I get the logical explanations for it. I've actually been in classes where um actually when I graduated with my degree, one of my professors was graduating with us. Like we were literally at the same graduation. So at graduation is when she says, oh, this is why it was hard for me to get your grades back because I was doing my homework as well. Oh, my. (laughs) Was she getting a different type of degree than you? She was was getting her doctorates, I believe it was. Either doctorates or her master's. It was a different degree, but it was just still kind of like. Why didn't you tell us this? Right. Yeah. I could have gave you some grace. Yeah. Okay. Right. And what you think? What do you think is a reasonable amount of time to get your grade back? Like you submit the so assignment the, on September first. How long do you think it should take? So depending on what the type of assignment is, right? So if you have just asked us to write a twelve-page paper, I'm not expecting you to give me my grade in two days because then that tells me you probably didn't read it to see, you know, what I actually did, because how did, if it's 25 of us in this class, you read all 25 of these papers in two days, that's like, that's talent. If you are able to do that, that is talent. Genius. Genius. (laughs) Um, So, you know, I could understand that taking like, you know, a week, maybe, maybe even two, you know, Um, but if it's something simple as a, you know, a summary of an article or a test that, you know, isn't one that's graded automatically. Um, we should be able to get that back within a few days. It shouldn't take, you know, more than a week for something simple like that. Have you found that your instructors actually say that in the syllabus? Do they tell you how long it takes, you know, the turnaround time for grading? Uh Off the top of my head, I can't remember if it was actually ever in a syllabus, Um, Mm -hmm. but I do know that I had at least one professor who would let us know, like, I remember her verbally saying, like, okay, it's going to take me a couple, you know, give me till this date and you should have your grades back. But at least then that's one thing that I'm not worried about. You know, it's like, okay, well, I know my grade will be here within that time frame. Okay, so now we got the juices flowing. I need to ask you a little bit more about this explicit instruction. What do you mean by that? 
Because some, so, somebody else might be relative. Which, what, what do you think explicit instruction is according to your so can I Can I give you an example of why I put that here? Um, yeah. It wasn't mm-hmm. an online class. It was act, one of my last face-to-face classes. And we were supposed to submit. This is when I was doing my associate. So I think we were turning in a um, like a lesson plan notebook. Mm-hmm. and It said, you know, we needed the age of the children, the activity and the materials. That's all she wanted at that moment. But it wasn't explicitly written like that. Right. It was just like, give me your lesson plan ideas. So I go through and I create this whole entire like manual. It has the ages, the activity, the materials. It has the instructions on what to do. Like it had this whole like plethora of things and I'm proud of it. I'm like, I worked my tail off on this thing. This is amazing. I'm gonna get it published. Like that's how I'm thinking in my brain. And when I get my grade back, I got a C. And I was like, why do I have a C? And the, and the, the professor looked at me and she said, because I asked you for A and B and you gave me A, B, C, D. I didn't ask you for all of that. So oh you just did a lot of work that you didn't have to do. Next time, just follow the instructions. Wow. And I was like completely like mind blown at that point. And from that day, it has been if the instructions are listed one, two, three, four, five, that is all I'm doing. I'm not going to go extra. I am not going to go down my rabbit hole. I need explicit instruction. If you are going to give me creative freedom, that's one thing, you know, but put that in there so I know where, you know, how far I can get, if that makes sense. So that's what I mean by explicit instruction. Okay, so did she provide a rubric for you for that assignment? Do you remember? No. What about a sample? No, there was none of that. Exactly. I'm really Mm -hmm. amazed, honestly, um, Mm -hmm. when I find out that samples are not provided because I experienced that in my PhD program. Um, Rubrics may be provided, but they're very generic that they could apply to any assignment. So they're not specific to what you were asked to do for that assignment. And then an instructional video, because oftentimes if you go over the instruction and just a quick screen share, then there's Mm -hmm. no confusion about what you're being asked to do. And so I am so glad that you brought that up because being explicit is not just written instructions, but oftentimes we need to provide visuals so that students can see the standard of work that we're looking for. And I think you would have known what not to include had you had a rubric and some samples to to look at. Exactly. And it was only it was only that professor that I can say um, that was, uh, you know, that specific about what she wanted and didn't want without being actually specific. Right. Um, the other the other classes, it was, you know you were able to, you know, as long as you, you did the assignment, but if there was more that you wanted to add, then, you know, you could do those things. Cause this was definitely in the fun times of getting to put your hands on things and make stuff that you could possibly use in your classroom. Like that's where, how I was thinking, it's like, yeah. Oh, I'm going to do this. So it, it's extravagant so that I can use this in the future. And it's not just an assignment. Yes. Well, I want to play a little game with you, Keisha. Oh, I like games. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say two words, which are opposites. And you tell me which one you prefer. For example, if I say pie or cake, which one would you prefer? I would say cake. Okay. <laughs> what if I say water or juice? Juice. <laughs> okay. All right. So here we go. I'm only going to give you seven little phrases and let's see what okay. we learn about you as it relates to online courses. Here we go. Face to face or online courses? Online. Okay. Discussion boards or live synchronous discussions? Live synchronous discussions. Okay. Group projects or group activities, which are done during actually during class group activities. 
Okay. Lectures or active learning? Active learning. Written instructions or instructional videos? Mm, instructional video. Okay. Written feedback or recorded feedback, which may be video or audio? Video, audio. And the last one, a research paper or a research project? Research project. <laughs> okay. Well, Keisha, <laughs> you are a wonderful contestant. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I learned a lot about you from that quick game. All right, you ready to tell us about your pet peeves? Oh, I sure am. Well, a pet peeve is a minor annoyance that an individual finds particularly irritating. It is something that bothers you more than it bothers others. So your pet peeve, Keisha, may be different from anybody else's, and that's absolutely fine. Share with, uh, with us what really annoys you when it comes to online courses. Keisha, what are your pet peeves? Okay, so first... I cannot stand pointless discussion boards. It's just busy work. I'm a whole grown adult. I'm already busy and there is no need to give me busy work. And to top it off, sometimes they'll ask you something like respond to three peers who, you know, and if the the peer actually read the material, they're going to have the same exact answer as me. So, (laughs) What am I supposed to say other than I agree? So that's the first one. I That is pointless in my opinion. Um, the next thing, it goes back to what my needs were. So that open communication, not having that, and not having feedback. Um, I have an issue, or I had an issue, to where I literally did an entire program, an entire program, like meaning I was in this program that it was only for an add-on. It wasn't for a degree. It wasn't any of that. It was an add-on to what my, the already, the, uh, excuse me, the degree that I already had. And here it is, only should have taken me a year tops and here we are two and a half years in only to find out at the very end that because I did not have communication with an advisor because my advisor left abruptly and then I had another advisor I think within a year's time frame I had went through four advisors and each one of them advised me to do something else only to find out at the end that I was in the wrong program from the beginning Mm -hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Woo. Hmm. That's a lot, right? So yes. I did. That just. <laughs> yeah, but you can't get that time back. First of all, you cannot. I could have already had my master's. The way my brain has processed it is that all this yes. time to add for an add-on, I could have already had my master's degree. So, what kind of add-on was it supposed to be? It was a licensure add-on. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's so basically for. It should have taken me a year. Yes. Mm, and it took, and you were in the program for two, you said? Two, two and a half? Two. Two and a half, technically. Oh, yeah. That was because definitely- one semester. And the only reason I add the, add the half is because one semester, the final class that I needed wasn't even offered. So I had to wait a whole nother to the next semester rolled around before I could take that class only to find out, yeah, you didn't need that. Mm. So, mm. yeah, it was wow. a good time. Those are so good stressful times. Those are your two pet peeves. Those are my two pet peeves. Other than that, I feel like I can make it through. Okay. I can do what I need to do, get everything done. As long as there's not a pointless discussion board that's just got me sitting here like I'm only gonna read the same three people every week. That's all I'm gonna do. I'm <laughs> gonna read the three people who I know actually read the stuff. And then I'm going to try to think of something else to say, but it is very annoying to have to do that. Yes, I am right there with you. I would pick my three people, look for those three mm-hmm. and not get out of the box because I know that they, they knew what they were talking about. They would say something that I could respond to, um, you know, because the responses oftentimes, well, when the PhD program, you have to cite and you have to go into depth like you're writing a mini paper. 
So you have to find somebody who said something worth writing about, you know, responding to. So I would pick my right. three and look for them in every class. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And the so, one thing about being in education is most of the time, it's the same people in right. all the classes. Exactly. So you know exactly who to look for. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have made it to the end to our Dear Professor segment, where you get the opportunity to share your heart with a fellow professor that you have in mind. Imagine there is an online bulletin board with sticky notes or messages from students to professors. What is the note you would leave one of your online college professors? Okay. Let me get my serious teacher voice on for this one. Um Dear Professor, thank you for pushing me to do more than just read the book or the article. You created an environment that wasn't just teaching to the test. Instead, your environment taught me how to take what I was learning and apply it to my real world experiences and to my work environment. Even though your class wasn't always rainbows and butterflies, sometimes you stress me out. And when I say stress me out, I mean, with all the pages and pages of reading. So much reading that sometimes I fell asleep with articles still in my hand. I even got a paper cut once from all that reading. I do know that you were being intentional with assigning assigning the reading, but I just want you to remember that sometimes less is better. If you ever hear or read this letter, I want you to keep that line from the song on TikTok in your head when you're assigning those articles and reading. Let's skip to the good part. But all jokes aside, continue to encourage your students because you never know your encouragement, your encouragement and dedication may help them see the good in themselves and aspire to go even further in their career, education and life. Sincerely, a grateful former student. Oh, Keisha, that was such an in-depth message. Let me tell you, I just really appreciate how you were transparent about the fact that the intensive reading was not something that you desired, but you also encouraged that professor and gave positive feedback. And I, I think it's powerful because even if students may not understand or agree with how a course is run or the level of rigor that's required, that should not stop you from voicing your opinion. So kudos to you for that. You made a compliment sandwich. Yay. (laughs) You get an A plus, 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 plus. All right. And I got my grade well before two weeks from now. I love it. That's right. That was an on demand grade. Okay. (laughs) Like Netflix. Okay. (laughs) You just pushed the button. I love it. it. So (laughs) as we close, let me share my takeaways from today's conversation. Keisha, when you are taking courses online, you need three things. Explicit instruction so you don't go down the rabbit hole, right? You need open (laughs) communication that is timely. And you also need feedback on your assignment so that you know how well you're doing in the course, certainly before the end and hopefully before graduation. (laughs) Did I get that right? Is that accurate? Absolutely. That is accurate. Well, good. Keisha, this was a stimulating and thought-provoking conversation. Don't you think so? I do. I'm really, listen, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I've had a really good time chit-chatting with you, especially about um, something that is definitely important to me, which is education. I encourage everybody to learn something every day, just learn something new, even if you don't know what it is that you want to do. One of my favorite quotes from Alice in Wonderland is, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So Mm. if you just take a step out on faith and just learn something new, you never know where it can take you. Yes, well, you closed it up nicely for us. I'm so thankful (laughs) that you blessed us with this on this series as our 10th guest. Okay, Okay. number 10. Number 10. I pray that you continue to make a positive compact, compact, impact, not compact, (laughs) on our world and um, through your dedication to our young children and the teachers who educate and serve them. I appreciate what you do at Head Start. I know you're doing a fantastic job. 
So thank you all. Try my best. Yes. Thank you all for joining us. Remember to comment, like, share, follow, and subscribe. I look forward to spending time with you next week on the Dear Professor series where college students who take courses online speak their minds. Bye-bye.